Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. The global ship fleet is constantly evolving, with the fleet undergoing regular turnover to keep the fleet fresh and performing. Each year, an average of 2,700 ships are built globally, while around 400 to 500 ships are retired and sent for dismantling worldwide. The age of the vessel, the high maintenance costs, and the increasingly strict environmental regulations are the primary reasons for ship breaking. Collision and grounding are also factors that might lead to ship decommissioning. The top countries for ship scrapping are India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, which together account for about 70% of the global ship breaking activity. Decommissioned ships are dismantled in specialized shipyards known as ship breaking yards. It is likely that a retired vessel you might know was dismantled in the Along ship breaking yard in India, the Chittagong ship breaking yard in Bangladesh, or the Gandhani ship breaking yard in Pakistan, the largest in the world. These massive facilities use a process called beaching, where ships are dismantled directly on the shoreline. Ship disposal primarily occurs in two ways, scrapping and reusing parts. Scrapping involves breaking the ship down to recover valuable metals like steel and copper. Meanwhile, reusable parts such as engines, navigation equipment, propellers, and other machinery are carefully removed and sold for secondary use. Working as a shipbreaker is one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet. It is a labor-intensive job, with crews manually handling much of the work. The environment is extremely hazardous, full of corrosion, asbestos, PCBs, and all kinds of oils, as well as occupational risks. Basically, once a ship is deemed unfit for service, the ship owner may sell it to a shipbreaking company, often through brokers specializing in ship disposal. After the sale, the ship is prepared for its final journey to find herself days later in one of the Southern Asia ship breaking yards. Timing is crucial. The vessel is beached during high tide when water levels are high enough to bring it ashore. Once the tide recedes, the ship becomes immobile, allowing workers to begin the dismantling process. At low tide, the ship sits grounded, ensuring stability for the workers as they dismantle it piece by piece. <laughs> the dismantling process starts with the removal of interior items, like doors, tables, and other furniture. Valuables, such as navigation equipment, engines, and other machinery are carefully extracted so they can be sold for reuse. Next, the ship's hull is cut into sections using only blow torches. Large segments like the cargo hold and sections are separated using a gravity method. After cutting the sections, they are pulled with ropes until they fall on the beach.
Manual handling is the norm in these yards, with a lack of minimal security precautions. The hardworking men work 12 to 16 hours a shift, often earning as little as $3 an hour. They face numerous hazards, including the risk of falling, exposure to toxic materials, and the danger of being struck by falling debris. In Bangladesh, materials recovered from dismantled ships enter a vibrant, informal resale market. Here, every item you can imagine is displayed for sale, from scrap iron, plates, and pipes, to doors and furniture, all openly available in local shops. These shops serve as a bustling hub for recycled ship materials, providing affordable resources to the public. The market not only supports local businesses, but also fuels an entire economy around recycled ship components. While the industry employs thousands of people in these countries, many regulations are overlooked due to the associated costs. Established in 2009, the Hong Kong International Convention for Safe and Environmentally Sound Recycling of Ships aims to ensure that retired vessels are properly disposed of. Its goal is to protect workers and the environment, especially from toxic materials. Older ships contain hazardous substances, such as asbestos, lead, and leftover oil, which require careful removal and disposal to prevent contamination of humans, marine life, and waters alike. Unfortunately, these standards are far from being followed, especially in third world countries. People are so broke that they can only afford a penny or less for dinner. If the hazardous materials are not removed before the ship is beached, they will be discharged into the waters, rendering the waters in a dangerous predicament. Once toxic materials are removed, the process of scrapping begins. Large sections of the ship, like the hull, cargo holds, and decks, are cut down into smaller pieces that are easier to handle. Workers then manually sort and separate these materials by type, focusing on metals, which make up most of the ship's mass. The extracted steel and other metals are sold to recycling plants to give them a new life. There, they're melted down and processed into raw materials. Recycling is a cheaper alternative to producing new metal ore. It also reduces environmental impact as it saves energy and doesn't use up as many natural resources. The recycled metal then re-enters the market, often as raw materials intended for construction, manufacturing, and infrastructure projects. The observed negligence of regulations in the shipbreaking industry doesn't apply to all segments. Some types of vessels, like nuclear-powered submarines, can have fatal consequences if strict rules are not followed. The recycling of these submarines, in particular, requires rigorous adherence to safety and environmental standards due to the risks associated with radioactive materials. The 
United States, for instance, has created its own program to make sure they don't harm the environment during the repurposing of its decommissioned submarines. In 1990, the Ship Submarines Recycling Program, or SRP, was designed by the U.S. Navy to handle retired ships by ensuring they are safely dismantled and recycled. The SRP operations are conducted in Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington. This is the only shipyard certified for recycling nuclear submarines since the program has begun. But before starting the recycling process, the ship must go through decommissioning and defueling. During this phase, the submarine officially retires from active duties and all sensitive equipment is removed. Simultaneously, highly trained personnel safely remove the submarine's nuclear fuel. <laughs> now, what was a USS has become an EX. The radioactive materials and the hull get separated here. Each will go in a different direction. The exhausted nuclear fuel is shipped by rail to the Naval Reactor Facility in the Idaho National Laboratory, or INL, where it is stored in special conditions. On the other hand, whole salvage begins at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. Here, skilled workers trained in hazardous materials handling dividing the submarine into major sections. The aft, reactor compartment, missile compartment, and forward section. Thick structures are cut with oxygen lances, while less thick parts are severed using oxygen slash MAPP gas torches. These operations follow strict safety and environmental guidelines, similar to those in nuclear ship maintenance. Once separated, workers begin removing the whole sections. Heavy lift cranes, specially designed for large-scale operations, are used to handle the massive weight and size of the submarine components. The operator is cautious and precisely maneuvers the loads to prevent shifting. The huge parts are loaded into rail car scrapping facilities, where they will be melted and transformed into raw materials. For the reactor compartment, it is a different story. Even after defueling, the compartment remains contaminated with radioactive substances, necessitating a special disposal method. Therefore, after separating the reactor compartment from other non-radioactive sections, technicians prepare it for shipment to the Energy Department's Hanford Nuclear Reservation. They carefully load it onto a barge and secure it within the steel deck to ensure it won't shift or fall into the water along the way. There, it will be properly stored and, later on, buried in a controlled environment designed to contain radiation and prevent environmental contamination. The manageable parts are sorted by type, mainly stainless steel, carbon steel, aluminum, monal, brass, and copper. These valuable metals are then transferred to the disposition services of the Defense Logistics Agency. This service disposes of these materials in various ways. They can be reutilized, donated, or sold. Yet some emblematic parts, like the submarine sail, might have the chance to attract as much interest as they always have by being turned into beautiful sculptures like the ones in Washington and Florida. That is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.